morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, do my usual thing and introduce and bug out because I tell you guys all I'm going to be, so I really apologize in advance. Tom Zone and I have a, a meeting with H&M, uh, of whom Steve Bellich was a uh, prime uh, driving member uh, before he retired. He was a, he is the retired CEO uh, from St. Francis Healthcare in Cape Girardeau, where we have actually several of our uh, past fellows. So uh, I've worked with them for years before I ever even met uh, Dr. Bellich, or Mr. Bellich, Steve. sorry. Steve, thanks. Uh, there, there's a few things he's done a whole <coughs> bunch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you kind of the, the script, and then I'm going to tell you some uh, different things. Uh, he's the director of Alder Bowen, a healthcare executive search firm now, and is a facilitator for Healthcare Leadership Institute CEO Roundtable, which I think you just came back from San Diego. Correct. Uh, for 18 years, he was a, he had a, uh, finished a 39-year career as a senior healthcare manager. Uh, he led St. Francis Healthcare and in Cape Girardeau. Uh, really, to un unprecedented market share and growth, it would. It, and uh, I heard it. I've heard it called a uh, a, a birth of a rebirth. Uh, somebody said uh, he made Cape Girardeau great again. Uh, I heard that. Uh, 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 this place is pretty impressive. For those of you who haven't visited uh, St. Francis, uh, and uh, Steve Furman can tell you a lot about it. That's where we where we stole him from. Uh, it's been one of the top 100 uh, best places to work six years running. Uh, uh, he, he brought the bond rating to a double A uh, minus bond rating with more than 400 uh, days cash on hand. For those of you who don't know what that means, like I used to not, uh, it's impressive. Uh, it's like doubly impressive, to be honest with you. Uh, also, they've got uh, greater than 95th percentile patient sat for years running now. Uh, and he took that from in the 20s when he, when he first started. Uh, and Basically, I'm going to get rid of all the rest of this stuff because it's too boring. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of really important good stuff, I'll just tell you that. Uh, the thing that I've learned uh, from Mr. Bellich is, is that he really uh, pays attention to metrics. He really holds people accountable. Uh, he incentivizes good behavior. He, he absolutely does not tolerate uh, behavior or, uh, or capabilities less than excellence. Uh, but uh, the part that makes him successful it's his ability uh, to uh, make and maintain relationships. Honestly, that's uh, been what I think has been the key to his success. He's told me this morning, we had breakfast for about 30 minutes this morning, uh, and we've been standing here for five, and he's told me already, I don't know, six or seven stories about people he happened to bump into in Florida, uh, mm. Europe, uh, San Diego, and uh, at University of, uh, what is it, where, where was it? Where was, where was that place? It's a big five school. No, no, no. Big 10 with yeah. 12, 12, 12 schools in a conference. And this guy named Bobby Knight, <coughs> he's bumped into. I mean, uh, and, and he has this ability <laughs> to make it, turn it into a meaningful relationship uh, that, that lasts for years instead of a fly by night sales type uh, approach. So, uh, with uh, more, uh, rather than me ramble, I'm going to let him take it. And again, I apologize for having to bug out. Oh, and, great. Great to meet Thanks, you. Thanks, Steve. Right. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Witt. Um, hopefully, he'll give us a golf lesson. I heard he's quite the golfer. I uh, shared the story this morning. Uh, I'm going to take you on a journey, if you will, the St. Francis healthcare system. I kind of stole something from President Trump, making St. Francis healthcare system great again. I'm going to give you a background where we were how we improved, and the success of the organization as a result of its people. I had the same executive team that was there when they were not doing well. Many of them just recently retired. There are CEOs that come in and nationally, and they blow out the executive team. They want to bring their own team in. That was not the case I did, because I thought it was important from a cultural perspective in Cape Girardeau but we were not doing well. Since I'm not a, a technical person, I'm going to ask him to pass the slides for me. So if I could, next slide, please. This is what St. Francis looked like when I first got there. And you're hearing me use the term we, because we accomplished this. Give you a background on it. Market, there's two hospitals in that community. Southeast Health, and you've got St. Francis. Uh, for, if you don't know where Cape Girardeau is, it is truly the right side of the state. You know what I mean by that? 
It is the home of Rush Limbaugh. So we balance the rest of the state out because they're kind of liberal to us as far as we're concerned. But it's a great work ethic, uh, some wonderful people. Uh, we are a Catholic hospital. We are sponsored by the diocese of Cape Girardeau and Springfield. We do not receive money from the diocese. We don't pay the diocese. The bishop has two roles. He approves the recommendation on the appointment of the CEO and any new board members. And that's really it. Now, we maintain a close working relationship, but he's got a huge uh, diocese that goes all the way from Springfield all the way to Cape Girardeau. We serve five states, Western Kentucky, Southern Illinois, Southern Missouri, Northeast Arkansas, Northwest Tennessee. That's a huge service area. Well, one of the reasons we serve such a large area is because you'll see over time, at one time we had 12 neurosurgeons. We also created some programs that were tertiary in nature to draw from these large areas. We also serve, I still call it us, we serve the six of the least 10 healthiest counties in the state of Missouri. We pull from the boot hill. So over 70% of our patients are Medicare and Medicaid patients. So you have a pretty uh, strong government payer mix. And competition in a two hospital town is about as ugly as it can get. Now you guys know a little bit about that. Uh, interesting enough, uh, the two hospitals there also spoke about a merger at one time, actually three different times, and I'll tell you about that. Next slide, please. I was the fourth CEO in seven years. That's not real good for stability, <laughs> much less a strategic plan. Can you imagine the employees? Things were really abysmal. When I got there, um, there was also a union campaign underway. I didn't know about it, the board didn't know about it. My wife commented to me after seeing our financials, what the attitude was like, she said, should I continue to unpack? That's, you know, they fire the NBA and the, the coach in the NBA. That's kind of how she thought this was going to turn out. I said, no, we got to give it some time. There was a proposed merger with Southeast. Physicians were not a part of it, and they were very angry about that. So the docs were real unhappy, so much so that some of the profitable services, like orthopedics, GYN surgery, ophthalmology to a degree, we're building a competing ambulatory surgery center. And at one time, they offered to share a third with each hospital, and the docs would have a third. The two hospitals said no, absolutely not. In fact, we're going to oppose your CON. You know, that's not a good working relationship. Ultimately, we'll turn that around as well. Next slide, please. We had no strategic plan. They got through the Joint Commission because they actually had an outline for a plan and called that their strategic plan. There was no accountability. There were a total of seven employed physicians, and those were the emergency department physicians. We had very limited services. There was no outreach. There was no primary care. We didn't do OB. Hadn't done OB in 36 years. There was no radiation, no cancer services. Uh, it, was, it was a hospital that predominantly uh, urology, G, uh, GU patients. Male patients, uh, we were dying. In fact, the Missouri Hospital Association had commented that we were kind of on a watch list because it was, uh, people thought I was nationally, there were some folks that said, why did you take that position? Potential's still there. Potential's in the people. That's where I saw the real commitment. Next slide, please. It's maybe hard to see. Well, you got all the, not used to this fancy AV equipment, huh, Steve? <laughs> uh, we had $112 million in gross revenues, $72 million in net, had a small operating margin, a little over 1%. Now, this is 1999. Uh, minimum you need is 3%. Uh, just to be able to replace things and ensure that you're paying fair wages and that you have opportunities for growth. We continued 
days cash on hand, as Dr. Witt said, is over 400 days. That number is now 455 days. We had 68 days. So we would be on a credit watch. We didn't have a bond rating. We had 41% market share. But one of the key points I found was the, was the top of the mind awareness. That's basically calling uh, households on a marketing basis and asking which hosp what hospital would you go to? Unaided study. We were third, third in a hospital town of two. <laughs> That's not good. I don't know was second, but you know what? There lied our opportunity to convert that I don't know. And that was an area we went after as we created a marketing and a, and a, a culture of accountability. Next, please. Other operating statistics. 26th percentile in patient satisfaction. Prior to that, it's the first time it was objectively measured by Press Ganey. Otherwise, we had said that we were good. The board was assured every month they were doing fine. 26th percentile. Employee satisfaction was not measured, but to me it said volumes, the fact there was a union campaign underway. The board didn't know about it, senior management didn't know about it. Physician satisfaction, again, not measured, angry, building the ASC. They also only allowed one hospital-based physician. And that hospital-based physician here is either um, a radiologist, an anesthesiologist, or pathologist to serve on the medical executive committee. The rest of it had to be independence. That's where we started. And the seven employed physicians were all ER. Next, please. Licensed beds, 246. One of the other key statistics is we had, my first day we had 67 patients in-house. 17 of those were in a skilled nursing facility that I knew I was gonna to have to close because they were losing over $2 million a year. So 50 med surge patients. Union campaign, 26th percentile, physicians are angry. There's not a lot of good news here. Hence, you know why my wife asked me, why are we here? Square footage, 340,000 square feet and 1,100 uh, employees. Seven uh, employed physicians of 189 on staff and we really had not much in primary care. In fact, when I first got there, I met with all the different groups. I spent a lot of time listening, going out and talking. I'm old school. I made rounds in the hospital. I loved doing that. Went to the physician offices, and I remember one of the primary care groups said, why does St. Francis hate primary care? I'd never heard of that. I mean, I just, that was a foreign concept to me. You work with your medical staff whether employed or non. Next, please. First lesson, I would say, was accountability. It's absolutely necessary for creating a successful and consistent culture. Uh, we didn't have that in the organization. If there was uh, budgets, for example, people do their budgets. Actually, they were given their budget, so they had no input on it. They have their budget. And most of the department managers just shoved it in the bottom drawer because nobody's going to ask them about it. In fact, one of the CFOs had in their appraisal from the previous CEO, he needed to create budget accountability. Steve will tell how we address that too. Next, please. How do we do that? Budget variances became a reality. Anything over $500 or 5%, whichever is less, was reported all the way up. I reviewed budget variances even after the vice president summarized it. So they were reviewing them. There is a statistic called a gross margin. And it basically, if you're a revenue center, it's the, what you can control in expenses as a percentage. Well, that became a key metric to hold people accountable. We did labor variances every two weeks based on uh, case mix adjusted uh, uh, productivity standards and where there were variances. Where I really s stressed on that, for example, if the volume went up, I would expect your hours to go up. What didn't make sense to me 
is if volume is down and your labor or overtime went up. If we began to get that in line. Strategic objectives we put together, and I'll go through the, how we did our strategic plan. There was a monthly update by the vice presidents of all their operational areas and their strategic plan. Where were they on each of those? Quality objectives. Not only did we have quality objectives, uh, but as I found out you all did this morning, you also did the safety, patient safety uh, and quality uh, report outs. We also had a quality close every month. This was reflected in performance appraisals, but the transparency of results, I can recall when I was asked, uh, we're gonna post, we're gonna post our financials outside of every department. We graphed it because a lot, it's complex otherwise, they're big numbers. What happens if we've got bad results? I said, well, I'd suggest we have good results. And same with patient satisfaction, posted outside in the hallways and quality indicators outside of departments. You really start holding people accountable. Next, please. Oh, by the way, all this was shared with our employees. We did uh, quarterly forums with employees, I had monthly meetings with employees. There was very transparent as an organization. There was very little, and sometimes you take some risk with that. But the staff all knew what was happening. We did the first strategic plan, and I announced we were going to evaluate the feasibility of establishing or reestablishing obstetrics. By the third round of meetings, I got a call from the local paper. I heard you're starting OB. You have to take that risk. But over time, it became an expectation. Honesty. It's got to be an honesty. Even as bad news, here's the basis for it. But I also believe. They're the same people that can fix the problems. They can drive the organization. I believe that our philosophy was physician-driven, physician-led, but professionally managed. It drove our strategy. It drove our basis for our budget, an annual business plan. And individuals were identified as who's responsible for which accountable uh, objective that we might have. So there's always the accountability with that. Next slide, please. The other part of our strategic plan that was critical was the process that we went through. We actually had more physicians engaged in our strategic planning process and going to our annual board medical staff leadership retreat than we had our, all of our administrative team and board members. That is very atypical. Maybe in an academic center you have more physicians engaged, or as many, but not in a typical community or regional system that we were. So to have that many physicians involved and buying into it also built trust, greater awareness, and they wanted to make sure the hospital also survived. Objectives were actually discussed and prioritized. I shared with Jonathan last night at dinner how we did it. We actually had a, a system called Option Finder. So like each of the audience would have these electronic devices. We'd put a, an objective up there. Let's say the objective was to uh, reintroduce obstetrics to the community from St. Francis. You, had, you could vote on it from a scale of one to seven. One would be don't go near it. Seven, we gotta do it tomorrow. And it would pop up on the screen all the results broken down by whether you were a physician or board member or administrative staff member. So I get three different scores up there. Then we have dialogue as to why do you think there's a difference? Uh, let's say um, the medical staff didn't want to do OB. They did, obviously, but let's say they didn't and the board and management thought they should. The facilitator then would start to discuss why do you think that should be? what's behind it. It facilitated conversation. It was very transparent. Also at this meeting, shared the financials. First time our physicians ever saw the financial situation of the hospital was when we presented, here's the numbers. Here's our quality. Here is our patient satisfaction scores. We thought we were good, 26th percentile. 
but also built trust. Next, please. Created a three-year strategic plan. It had both um, the strategy for the overall organization. There were individual operational objectives, and we were also divided up into, uh, we created uh, SBUs, uh, or strategic business units, long service lines. And they would have their own strategic plan that fed up into the larger hospital or system-wide plan. Next, please. Innovation. I think innovation is the key to viability and sustainability. Have to continue to innovate, or I think you're circling the drain. This also helps us respond to the challenges and opportunities that are in healthcare. This is not the first time many of you have heard this is the greatest period of change ever in healthcare. It is another change, guaranteed. We all know that, but it's not the first time. Next slide, please. I'll show you what I mean. 1982, it was called TEFRA, fixed reimbursement for a year. Then this thing called DRGs, that was the end of the world. Now, some of you are too young to even know. Some of you may not have been around in 83. The Clinton health plan, or the Hillary plan, was 93. <laughs> then there was the Budget Balance Act of, uh, of 1997. That was a reduction in payment overall. Then Obamacare, and then the most recent one with BBA2. We have survived and been successful, basically as an industry, along the way. Do we get a lot of scrutiny? Yeah. And we should. We should be held accountable for our actions, our outcomes. But we've also gotten better and more accountable along the way. Next, please. Here's the new programs and services that came about as a result of those strategic plans and building a truly a healthcare system. We had, we started OB, but we opened it with a level three neonatal intensive care unit. And uh, that has been very, very successful for us. The radiation therapy, which led to IMRT, and we have a cyber knife, open wound care. We have a trauma center that really operates more as a level two. The reason we've maintained the three, the orthopods said we don't want you out trolling for indigent patients. We've already got a 70% government payer mix. And we're pulling from southern Illinois uh, down on the boot hill, and those are not really high payer sources. Joint ventures. At one time, we had 11 different joint ventures going with members of our medical staff. Some of those over time, those doctors became a part of St. Francis Medical Partners. That was our physician group. Uh, others, the laws changed, so we had to unwind those. We created a joint venture LTAC. That orthopedic surgeon that helped develop that has an LTAC up here. It's called Landmark. Actually built nine throughout the country. But we built it 300 yards from our front door so we could transfer patients there. It's been very successful uh, for us. Medical office buildings, we built three of them. And that was an avenue not only to build primary care, but also to bring in additional doctors to the community. Ultimately, we had 32 sites for ambulatory outreach, primary care, urgent care, and diagnostics. Uh, that really has led us to have 80% market share in primary care in Cape County. In Butler County, where Poplar Bluff is, we have all of the adult uh, primary care practices, all of them, and that's huge. And that becomes a referral pattern to us. Next, please. Partnerships. We didn't do it all alone. Cleveland Clinic. We were the sixth hospital system to have an affiliation with the Cleveland Clinic for heart and vascular. Uh, we were, um, until recently, a member of the MD Anderson Cancer Network, the same network you're a part of. That's been a change since I've left. But that organization, we were also the third, and then we were the longest standing member of the MD Anderson Cancer Network. It was critical because we were just getting started in cancer care and didn't have, I still had to recruit oncologists. We still had radiation oncologists to expand. So 
starting from scratch effectively. The Health Network of Missouri, that's been a great partnership, not only in terms of development of a clinically integrated network, but also from a quality basis. Anytime you can exchange information and be able to grow and learn from one another, I think that's very, very positive and helpful. You can't do it locally. You can't go over and talk to Boone what you guys are looking at doing this and that because it's a competitive market in that respect. And then MPAC, the broader network that uh, Mizzou, the Mercies, and uh, Mosaic created, and we were the first clinically integrated network down in Cape Girardeau. Next, please. Construction expansion. First of all, I'm not a construction expert, and I laugh when I tell people I only had, we grew from 340,000 square feet to 1.6 million square feet of physical plant. And I ask two questions. I want to know which staff and physicians are working with the architects to design the space. We actually have them sign off. So the nurses were wearing hard hats going on the site and they were involved with it. Housekeeping, respiratory therapy, all of them were engaged with it. Two reasons. One, they have to work there every day. I didn't. I had an office. Which administration was the last place to get anything new, by the way. We had to move because of the construction project we had going with the new patient tower. We never missed a budget deadline or the budget, and we never missed a construction time frame. And the other thing is, I never had typically a physician would come to my office and say, who's the idiot that designed this? I didn't have that. Well, doctor, your name's right here, because they'd sign off on it. It was wonderful, because the buy-in was tremendous. And I really believe that's also why we were able to stay within our construction uh, timelines and budget. Next, please. This is just a list of some of the projects we had on that going to 1.6 million. Health and wellness uh, with the medical office building, 17 million. Outpatient registration, 12 million. Emergency department, we tripled the size of the emergency department, 21 million. Heart hospital, 84 million. Const the Cancer Institute was also part of that. The new patient tower, which is one of the things we finished in 2015, was $127 million. But in addition to that new patient tower, considering we just reintroduced obstetrics back in 2001, we now have a women and children's pavilion because of the volume that we've created. Ambulatory sites in Poplar Bluff, Cape Girardeau, Dexter, and Farmington. They're all primary care sites that have diagnostic imaging capabilities. Next, please. Next critical area or learnings from our perspective was aligned employees, aligned and engaged physicians, and aligned middle management. And middle managers, I think you have the toughest job in the hospital. I'll touch on that why. Next slide, please. In order to engage our employees, and Dr. Witt touched on how we engaged our staff, we had a unique program. It was called the Gain Share, and then we changed it to Service Quality Award. And all employees were eligible except for senior management and employed physicians. Recognize we're up to 256 employed physicians now. 50% each quarter of any excess over the budgeted bottom line would be paid out in the form of a bonus to our employees, adjusted initially for patient satisfaction and then three clinical quality indicators as CMS came online with those later on. That program, let's say you're a million dollars over budget uh, on a positive side. 500,000 is paid out. You divide it by the total number of hours everybody works. Say 500,000, it's a dollar an hour. So everybody got the same dollar an hour just multiplied by the number of hours people worked. It was an incentive for people to work more hours. It was an incentive to align patient satisfaction whether you are in housekeeping, where you interact with patients, you're in nursing. Uh, we had a culture of we walk people to their departments. I was late to more than one meeting as a result of walking a patient and their family to a department. That program, and I left in 2017 in September, 
had paid out at that time uh, over $79 million. That was, a, and that's all posted in the hallway. So people actually saw we're putting our money where our mouth was. Next slide, please. Succession plan. We thought it was extremely important that we develop a succession plan throughout the organization. And we have done that. But one of the things that we did, and Steve Furman was a big part of that, we also had personal and professional development even for non-management staff. So if a nurse wanted to stick her toe in what's management like, we actually had a program that they could be a part of. They would apply for that. The nice thing is, it also gave them a greater appreciation of what we were trying to do as an organization, other than what we shared with all the employees in the employee forums. We had a formal leadership development that we started back in 2001. So I'll touch on it in a minute. Next slide, please. Physician engagement. Communication is the key. And you, can, you obviously know, if you tell one member of a physician group Whatever, whatever issues there may be, you've only spoken to one member of that group because my partner, he doesn't speak for me. Physicians, if you give them the data, if you talk to them, you'll be surprised. They, they listen, they want it to be a better organization. They want to work with you. They don't understand sometimes our language. And that was something that we had to come up with a common language. I'm sure how we did that. But we shared our financials, our quality outcomes, they shared that with our board, our medical staff, our medical staff presented to our board on the quality outcomes, part of our quality close, and, and strategically. Next slide, please. We created what I call clinical medical directors, probably similar to your department chairs, I would assume, where uh, we had both St. Francis medical partner physicians and independent physicians, where they could earn a bonus, with five measurable objectives. Three were quality, one was financial, one was strategic. But in order to assist that, they were aligned, like with, let's say it's a clinical area, with a nurse exec and the service line exec and the physician. And the physicians, and the three of them, their role was to align the physicians, whatever those three, uh, those three quality objectives were, the additional financial and strategic, and then they in turn had to align nursing and the rest of the organization. Guess what? Selling, we're all going in the same direction. When the orthopods agreed to only two types of implants, that was a huge uh, improvement coming from five and getting it down to two where they're both at the same uh, cost level was a big success. That's one example. Next slide, please. The objectives had to be approved by the board quality committee. This is a compliance requirement more than anything. The medical staff quality committee, the medical executive committee, and the board executive committee. So we were not shorting quality, clearly. We did not have any inappropriate uh, compliance requirements under the Stark Law. Next, please. In order to do this with the physicians, much like our middle managers, oftentimes we ask physicians or department directors you take your best lab tech and say, okay, now you're gonna run the lab. It's a multi-million dollar business. You look at the physicians. They went to medical school. They didn't have time to get an MBA while, while they're in school. So we helped them provide with the management tools. And we did that, we started out with a Hogan personality assessment, which was very insightful to be able to provide them where their, some of their internal strengths were and their approach. Next slide, please. We focused on adult learning principles with visioning, uh, their communication, change management, how to handle that, how to bring that about. One of the bigger ones was team building. Because I don't know too many physicians that went to medical school on a team basis. And I know there's doing some more unique things trying to have physicians learn to operate within teams because it's so essential, not just uh, from a uh, from a clinical basis, but from an outcome from patient care. Conflict resolution was another. That, how do I, you know, the physicians, they write an order and it's done, right? 
you guys never would miss an order. So I'm confident that if I'm a manager now as a physician, I said you do it because I'm a doctor. That doesn't, they may do it, but it may not go over real well. So we learned to work through conflict resolution. We gave them some of the business acumen. And it was really well received by the physicians that were a part of it. I think they made better decisions, they got along better, and they addressed internal issues, particularly physician behavioral issues, within their department or section because of some of this additional training. Next, please. Middle managers. As I said, I think you have the toughest job. We uh, created the Leadership Development Program, ran through about 2014. We were moving really towards lean. We had been using lean. It had such a negative connotation. We had to change that approach. So we actually replaced it with the uh, Performance Improvement Academy. And that initially, it, you're using this uh, lean with Six Sigma along with change management principles. And we were benchmarking best practices, not just internally, but on a national basis, getting access, talking. Health Network in Missouri was an example of being able to get access to that kind of information. Next slide, please. Managers initially applied, managers, directors. Then it became mandatory because we were problem solving using Kaizans. And it really was great because I liked it because staff nurses, staff techs, whatever the position might be, they became part of the solution. Just like we did the construction projects, very much we were taking individual, whether it be revenue cycle or whether it be uh, a direct patient care, uh, UTIs, whatever it might be focusing on a quality basis, we would use these Kaizans as a means to create a common language for physicians and staff alike. We did uh, housewide uh, quality and safety report outs. Uh, you all do that. We did it for our whole, uh, uh, all the department managers. Uh, and it would take an hour. It was 10 o'clock every day, 10 to 11, and went around the room and reported out. We had daily performance metrics that were readily identifiable. On, so when I would round on a floor, I could see what their performance standards were that day, where they were. And most of the time, I was giving them accolades. It's not an I gotcha, that doesn't work for anyone. And these uh, results then were reported on, on an accountability basis to our board quality committee. Next, please. Let's see what happened. We went from 112 million in gross revenue to 1.7 billion in revenue because of new programs, new services. Well, what's that mean on a net basis? 72 million to 495 million. From operating margin, we averaged a margin of 7.6%. That is a remarkable number, particularly coming from 1.2. We went from 68 days to 403 as of September, and I found out as of uh, December 31st, they were 455 days cash on hand. What that basically means, how many days can you go without a nickel coming into the hospital or the system and pay bills? They could go 455 days. They earned a double A minus bond rating with Fitch. That's one of the bond rating agencies and the other is Standard & Poor's and it's an A plus. Market share went from 41% to 58% and we became uh, top of the mind awareness first in the market. Next slide, please. Patient satisfaction. We went from 26th percentile to the 97th, we were consistently in the 90s, at least up until September. Uh, I'm not sure where they're at now. Employee satisfaction from a union campaign to um, seven consecutive years as a top 100 best places to work. Physician satisfaction, this is probably what I'm most proud of. We hit the 99th percentile with Press Ganey. Uh, management and the relationship between management, there's a question of management and uh, medical staff, we hit the 99th percentile as well. I was very proud of that accomplishment. And that's something, we're 95th overall, but that is what we had accomplished. That management isn't, isn't Steve Belich. The trust, maybe, but at the same time, the trust, if it's not with a staff nurse or anyone else, it still falls back on the CEO. That's why I was most proud of what our team all, all of our, I'll show you how many employees we now have, was able to accomplish. Next slide, please. 
We went from 246 licensed beds, we actually added beds to 321. Uh, the census at 67 with 50 that were med surge. That number is now 220 on a regular basis. The other growth was the square footage. I mentioned earlier 340,000 to 1.6. Employees, in a rural setting, to go from 1,103 to over 3,000 employees, that, it's just, it's really amazing. Um, we were able to put in systems like we have a different EMR system. We have Epic, the competitor of Cerner. Um, we're the smallest system in the country to be on Epic. Uh, but it was something, when we selected it, interesting way we did it. We had Cerner come in for three days and present, lay it all out. People had hands actually touch it. And we did the same for Epic. We had 340 nurses touch it. That was amazing. We had 97 physicians touch it, and it was overwhelming in our case for Epic. But they couldn't complain once they put it in, saying, so who's the idiot that selected the system? Once again, just like our, we do equipment or construction. And market share, overall, when you blend it in between our primary and our secondary service area, we had 85% market share in primary care alone. That's a big number. Next slide, please. This is what the medical center looks like today. That's a far cry from that earlier picture that you saw, and this does, obviously does not include all of the 32 satellite locations that we have. So I think the, the takeaway that I would have for all of you, besides some of those key lessons I have in there, one, the success of the organization is due to the people that you work with, day in and day out. It's not just physicians, not just nurses, because we all know if the rooms aren't getting cleaned, you're not gonna be able to turn over beds, the ERs gonna get backed up, and it's a domino effect. That's why the gain share program, the bonus program was so important to all be tied together. Second, I think you need to give people the tools. A lot of it's an educational tool basis. Very intelligent people, they wanna do the right thing. But if you don't give them the tools, it's a little hard to ask them to accomplish something. One other thing I think is important. What you all do, and what I had the privilege to do for 39 years, is healthcare. We touch people, we touch their lives, their families. That is, that is a remarkable sense of, of pride in what you all do, whether you're directly involved with patients or indirectly involved. Because you can't do that if you're in manufacturing or things along that line. Take nothing away from those other industries. But it's very, very special what you all do. And I want to thank you on behalf of all those lives that you touch and that I had the privilege of working with staffs all throughout the country at different times in my career and all the lives that they touched because it's, it's pretty remarkable. So thank you for what you all accomplish. What questions can I answer? Sagar, are we still good on time? Perfect. Sure. So, that was an 18 year journey. Yes. That uh, was really quite impressive. What do you think, how early in that journey do you feel like you started to see the change in the culture that you were trying to get? I mean, was it five years? Years. At what point did you start to see that okay, we're, we're making a stride and changes in the culture that we want and get us where we are today? I would say it was probably in the second year after we, the gain share was put into place and it started to pay. And, and one of the questions I had during the union campaign, again, I was rounding and I met with small groups of nurses. And one of the things I asked them, Name one thing I've not delivered on that I said I would. You've got to give me this opportunity. And to my last day, same sort of thing. Name one thing I did not deliver on. You know, if I screw up on something, that's fine. I'll accept that. But you'd never want to have your integrity questioned or your credibility. And to me, our second year when we started seeing more and more things we're delivering on, 
And when we started obstetrics in 2001, that changed everything. And we're aggressive. You open it with a level three neonatal intensive care unit, I mean, that's just, most people don't, there's never been one in Cape Girardeau. They now have perinatology as well. So we, that really, I think, was the, was the watershed moment. And then it just started rolling. I've got a list of things that you marked on the first five years. How many of them were um, business initiatives that you developed, and how many of them are were things that bubble up from the staff? Things that were under the birds under the saddle that never got addressed? Or... Well, when we did our strategic plan, it was inclusive. So staff, what but be able to give us ideas, obviously. I mean, OB was everybody wanted obstetrics. Um, there were, uh, on the service lines, the staff were directly involved with that. Take the cardiac one. Uh, David Stagner would meet with his staff, and they were giving suggestions, like when we started doing TAVR. Now, that came from the, that between the staff and uh, our, one of our chief of cardiac surgery at the time. That came from within. We don't have all the answers. That's the last thing you want to say is that, well, the CEO didn't come up with that. No. That's why we also engaged with the, the process that we used with Option Finder for folks that provide input. So that, and I was always open to it because some, I mean, you listed as to evaluate the feasibility of and maybe it made a lot of sense. And they all weren't there just because it was profitable. We created a trauma center. I mean, that uh, really was not you know, too much of a money loser, but it was important because there had never been one, but we reduced the mortality uh, in that part of the state by creating that uh, trauma service. Other questions? Steve, I, I appreciate uh, that you mentioned that one of your uh, proudest uh, achievements in, in all of these many great achievements was uh, a 95th and 99th percentile uh, physician engagement. Uh, 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 your individual behaviors and the behaviors of your leadership team that went from not measured to 95th and 99th percentile? The executive team, it's a, understand, it's the same executive team that was uh, there before I got there, was there through um, my entire career. I take that back. We had, after seven years, the CFO uh, had retired. But we had somebody who'd been there for 22 years, took over his role. Um, I thought they took right to it because they, I think, were thirsting for some leadership and engagement to be a part of it. Um, they need some of the tools. How did this work? I also met with my <clears throat> executive team members, uh, usually on Monday and Tuesday, I met with all of them individually, generally an hour. Nursing was generally an hour and a half, sometimes uh, longer uh, because of the expansive area. And then we met as an executive team every Wednesday. So there was a lot of communication among ourselves. It was also a group that when I left that room, we were all on the same page. And believe me, in individual meetings and executive team, more than one, they'll disagree with me. That's all right. Let's figure out where, where, where do we need to go with this. And there's sometimes, yeah, you're absolutely right. Best example I can give you, before we built the whole new patient tower, uh, vice president for patient care, we didn't have, uh, we had semi-private rooms, and they're all private now. And uh, Jeannie Fadler said, you know, we really need to have a master facilities plan three. I'm going, I can't go back to the board. I, we're just finishing up two right now. But she kept laying it out, and she was absolutely correct. That was the right thing to do. We also took advantage of the low interest rates at that time. So it's, I really believe that that was critical, that communication with the team. And yeah, they had no problems telling me I wouldn't do it that way. But I know when we left the door, left the room, we were all on the same page. Did I answer your question? Uh, and, and when you talk about your team, or, uh, did you have physicians on that team? Or, or how do you think their interactions with physicians? We created the first Vice President for Medical Affairs. Did that in my first six months there. There had never been a physician on senior leadership. Um, and that was, a, obviously you could see the lacking source of, with physicians. We also participated in all of the physician committees. 
the whole executive team sat in on the uh, med exec. So it really, I think there was a lot of communication there as well. Other questions? Can you uh, describe the value with the Health Network of Missouri from, from your perspective, like outside of Columbia, and kind of how that all connected and, and maybe the value that that provided? When you look on the map, you wouldn't think it would create a lot as far as, because we didn't compete with one another for referrals or anything. So there wasn't a referral basis. Where I believe it came into, one is um, sharing a quality information, uh, common set. Uh, there's some huge advantages, obviously, access to residents for St. Francis. It also became the basis for us to create the first clinically integrated network within impact outside of what uh, Mizzou and Mercy already had, or, or uh, Mosaic already had. Would not have been able to do that on our own. We just didn't have the depth. I mean, we only had an executive team of uh, seven plus myself. So that's not, we had a large spans of control. I mean, that clearly was a challenge for us. Health Network of Missouri got us up a lot faster than we would have ever had. And in fact, that's why we're still an essential part of that. Even though the central um, part of uh, the Mizzou uh, Health Network of Missouri has their own CIN, we have ours down there. But with the support of Steve Witt and others, that's, been, that's helped them along a great deal. It's a good question. Steve. I want to just thank you for coming to Columbia Lecture Valley. It's just awesome to see you, and I've enjoyed hearing the story of the last 20 years of what you did for St. Francis. One of the things I think that Steve probably doesn't share enough about what he did in my exposure to the five years I was there was uh, you know, he talked about the accountability and strategic plan and budgeting process and that was palpable in the culture so that really kept everybody attuned to what was important on a, on a macro level but I think what Steve probably does share enough is how much he invested in the people uh, and he kind of alluded to it in a light way but uh, he we uh, presented a three-year strategy for leadership development and uh, I think Steve in his nature is quite aggressive and progressive as well. And he, he locked in on that, and that really transformed leadership, I thought, in the, in the time we were there. That was so well appreciated by the leadership team. And to this day, they're still, they're, they still think of that, uh, that experience. I don't know if you yeah. share well, that. Thought. Many of you heard of Quint Studer, Studer Group. Quint came to Cape Girardeau to learn how we were doing things. He considered St. Francis, little Cape Girardeau, as a best practice. And what we had in our education, that whole leadership development actually blew him away. Uh, he also reminded me, because uh, those are expensive courses he has, right? It took him a day to get to Cape, spent the day in Cape, it took him another day to get back to Florida uh, without any compensation. But that's another example, I think, of learning of best practices. You have a wonderful organization here. Uh, what you all are, the, the, the jewel, the central part of the, the state. You're part of a bigger group as well. You truly take a leadership role in the state. And I wish all of you the best of luck. You've got some great leadership. I have a lot of respect for your senior management team. I had the privilege to work with them through uh, Health Network in Missouri. I, I've known Jonathan for even longer than that. Um, you guys are positioned well. I enjoyed your docs and what their interaction is that they've had with our physicians. Uh, we've also recruited some very fine, well-trained physicians from up here, from surgeons to infectious disease doc to some primary care. Um, and for that, I thank you for being a resource to the entire state. Thank you all and God bless. <laughs>